Hey, this is Brock Lemires, and we're continuing our study of embedded systems design. We are looking at the timer system on the MSP430, and we are going to now look at the next feature of a timer system, which is called a timer compare. Okay, so here's the block diagram of the timer system on the MSP430. This is timer B. And <clears throat> let's see. So you have your, obviously, you have your counter here with adjustable length. Uh, you have dividers, you can choose which, which clock source that you want to clock this, and everything's great. And up until now, what we have done is we've looked at the ability of the system to generate <clears throat> an event by raising a flag any time that this timer overflowed. So it would count all the way up to its maximum value, and then roll back to zero, and then keep going. Okay, and we put it in continuous mode, and that was great. And we had some control over how fast it would overflow because we were able to set the length of the timer. We could reduce it to 12 bits, 10 bits, or eight bits. And then we could slow it down also by choosing a slower clock or also dividing down the clock. So we had some control, but we didn't have the ability to control it down to the count. And what I mean by that is if you think about the resolution of the events that can be triggered here, you know, you're basically limited by the number of counts in the overflow. So it's two to the 16, and then you have an event. Then another two to the 16 counts, then you have an event. <clears throat> Even when you reduce it to two to the eight, it's still two to the eight, and then you have an overflow. Two to the eight, and then you have an overflow. And so a compare is when we are going to be able to determine the exact count that we want the event to trigger on. And the way that it's done <clears throat> is by using these compare registers. And so what the, the whole theory of this is that you, as the developer, <clears throat> decide when you want the event to occur what, or what count value, and then you simply place it into one of these compare registers, and then you enable it, or well, actually, whenever you place something in here, when the timer reaches that value, this hard-coded value that's sitting in here, it will raise the flag. And then that flag can then be used to trigger an interrupt. And the beauty of this is that when you do it, <clears throat> you can choose whatever value you wanna put in here. And this allows you to get very precise timing. So you don't have to wait for this two to the N interval. You can say, okay, I wanna figure out, I want something to be generated or I want a flag to be generated every 0.5 seconds as close as you can possibly get it. So then what you do is you calculate the number of counts that would take for the various clock that you're using, and then you find that exact count value, you pop it in there, and then every time it reaches that value, it will increment or it will set a flag, okay? Now, let's talk about terminologies. Remember, timer B on the MSP430 has four different timers. So it has four independent binary counters that sit there. TB0, TB1, and TB2 <clears throat> each have three compare registers, okay? Now, one of the things you're looking at here is you're going, what's this capture thing? It turns out a capture is another feature. We're not talking about the capture right now. We're talking about a compare, but they share the same register, okay? So that capture we'll cover later. We're talking about compares. <clears throat> but since TB0, 1, and 2 each have three of these compare registers, the terminology that you'll see in like the interrupt vector tables are timer zero underscore B3, timer one underscore B3, timer two underscore B3. And that's because that they have CR zero, one, and two. So they have three of these compare registers. It's pretty cool though, because you can have three separate values that you load into here to generate flags at different time points during the count. The terminology for <clears throat> the fourth counter, which is TB3, is timer three underscore B7. And that comes from the fact that you actually have seven different compare registers for that fourth timer, which is called TB3. Okay, notice that <clears throat> every single one of these compare registers has its own flag and its own enable. That means every one of these can generate an interrupt when it equals or when the counter equals the value in here. You can also change the value in here during a program. So you can update these dynamically in the program, but the whole theory of operation of this is that you put a value in here and when the timer gets to that value, it will assert the flag. 
If you choose, you may then also have that trigger and interrupt by enabling the interrupt, the local interrupt and also the, the global interrupt. And then you can have an interrupt service routine which can take action. Okay, let's talk about interrupts. <clears throat> when you look at the interrupt vector table for our M, uh, MSP430 FR2355, there are actually two vector addresses for each timer. So notice that we have eight vector addresses that sit out here that support the four timers. Now, notice that there's a lot of these flags that are shared here. So you can have a situation where if you're using one of these flags, you will have shared uh, a shared vector. So you will have to put the logic in your interrupt service routine to figure out whether or not, or what which compare register was used. Notice that this int 22 for timer zero, uh, or excuse, yeah, timer zero, timer B zero, it shares with the overflow flag. And so this is the one we've been using. This is this TB0 IFG. That's the overflow flag. It's shared with a couple other of these compare flags. Now, notice something. Notice that the CCR0 register for timer 0, timer 1, timer 2, and timer 3, look at it. It gets its own vector. Now, this is pretty unique. You don't see a lot of peripherals that get their own vectors. I mean, even reset shares vectors. Even the non massable shares vectors or multiple things share the vector, but man, look at that. That 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 flag by itself, CCR0 in each timer gets its own vector. That must be something special. Well, it turns out it is special. It has a special behavior when you put the timer in up mode, okay? When you put that in up mode, you get to do this. You will actually set in CCR0, the maximum value that the timer is allowed to go up to before it rolls back over and goes down. Now this is pretty this is pretty transformational, honestly, <laughs> because before we would let this go all the way up to the two to the n value and roll over. So it'd go all the way up to two to the 16 and then roll over, all the way up to two to 16 and roll over. And yeah, we could come down here and put hard-coded values in here in order to you know raise flags as those events come along. But this CCR0, it, this allows you to actually put the maximum value in here. So if you wanted the timer just to count up to, let's say, 5,000 and then go back to zero and then count up to 5,000, you can do that by placing 5,000 in the CCR0 register and then put the timer into up mode. If you wanted to count up to 1,000 and then roll back over, put it 1,000 in here and then put this in up mode and you can do that. This becomes very, very powerful because this can set basically the rollover period that is continually running. Just because it's an up mode doesn't mean it doesn't repeat. Up mode just means it counts up to and then it hits the value in CCR zero and then it goes back to zero. But when you do that, you can also configure the other registers to trigger events during the count value. So this, this gives us the ability to start generating, you know, signals that look like something we want. We can generate signals that have a duty cycle of something other than 50%. And, and this, is, this becomes a real powerful tool. Okay, how do you configure all this? Well, if you go and look at all the registers associated with the timer B system, you're gonna notice that there's a whole lot of registers in here and they have a lot to do with the compare functionality. First and foremost, Every compare register has its own address, okay? So notice that you have compare 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The, the naming convention for this is you see here TBX CCRN. The X stands for which timer it is. So we know that in the timer B system, we have four counters. So we have TB0, TB1, TB2, TB3. <clears throat> Instead of listing all those out and making this excessively long data sheet, they just say it's TBX. And we, we plug in the value. So if we want to configure timer B0, we put a zero there and that's the name of the register that we want to mess with. Then when you look at which of the compare capture registers we want to use, again, you put a number in there. So we can put zero, one, or two. And it's up to us to, keep, to know that if we're using timer B0, it only has three compare registers. You can only have values of zero, one, and two for N. Same thing with timer B1. You can only have 0, 1, and 2 for n. Same with timer B2. You can only have 0, 1, and 2 for n. But if you use timer B3, whoo, 
Look at what you got. You got all seven of these. Okay. And of course, they all start at zero. All right. Well, the, the index starts at zero. So those are what those registers are. And again, that's where you put the value you want to generate the flag when the timer gets to that value. So you are going to move information into these registers to configure it. Okay. Also, every single compare register has its own configuration register. So now you have a whole ton of different configuration registers. They follow the same terminology where you have TB01 or 2, 01 or 2 or 3, depending on which timer you're setting up. And then, of course, you have the N, which refers to which register you're setting up. But you are going to be able to go into each compare register individually and set up its bits. So take a look at all the things that you can set up. First and foremost, you start down here at bit zero. Here's your flag. <clears throat> so CCIFG, there's your compare flag. Uh, that's cool. And then you have some flags which are dedicated to the capture feature. We don't use that. You know, some of these like output level, that's capture. Here's where you put it into either the compare or the capture mode. So that's an interesting one to know about. It'd be nice to know whether that's a zero or a one, right? Whether it is. Turns out that it's, it's in compare mode by default. Here's your interrupt, CCIE. So you got your local interrupt for that register. You've got some output modes. Eh, that really, I don't know, that does, we don't use that. Uh, you have capture mode if you're in capture. Compare latch, that, that's another one that's used for ca capture. Uh, input select, what, I don't even, yeah, there's stuff there we don't use. Actually, a, almost everything in here is used for captures. And we're not using captures, we're using controls. So for, not control, compares. So for compare, it's actually pretty simple. You just set it up. Uh, <clears throat> you just set a value in there and then let it rip. Okay. <clears throat> you also have, of course, this interrupt vector uh, register so that if you do have, if you're using multiple compare registers and you have multiple fire at the same time or at close to each other, this can provide a, a a code that tells you which of them fired with the highest priority with of course zero being the highest. And so that just ha that's just useful if you're gonna enable a bunch of these and you don't wanna actually manually put the logic in here to check which flag got fired, okay? Okay, that is an overview of the timer compare and that background right there is gonna get us to the point where we can actually write our first program that will use the timer compare feature on the MSP430. All right, that is it. As always, remember to support my channel by subscribing and goodbye.